When I was growing up, I lived in Punjab in India, my birthplace. My memories come alive as I journey back to my childhood village. I have journeyed halfway around the world to discover how life is today. Punjab is one of the 28 states in India situated in the country's northwest. There are about 80 million Punjabi speaking people all over the world. Out of those approximately 25 million live in this part of Indian Punjab. My daily life as a boy in Punjab consisted of rising at dawn, taking a fresh water bath at the well and having my morning breakfast, yogurt, buttermilk and chapatis cooked over a cow dung fire. I walked to the primary school where I studied basic languages, mathematics, history and geography. Our values were based on our faith and life revolved around family. Today as I travel on the famous and much written about Grand Trunk Road from New Delhi, I remember when this road had only two lanes. Once the longest road in Asia, it still winds through hundreds of towns and villages from Peshawar in Pakistan to Calcutta in India. The road built hundreds of years ago remains even today a vital lifeline for Punjab, connecting it with the rest of the country. The bulk of the population of India used to live in villages. Over half a million of them dotted the map. These villages had uniform kind of habitation and were complete community units self-sufficient, supporting everybody who lived there. The recent trend in urbanization and globalization have also brought about changes in rural life. While Indian villages are eager to adapt to new ways, they are also careful in maintaining their old traditions. They continue to live both in the past and the present at the same time. Agriculture, the chief commercial activity of Punjab, has undergone changes since I was a boy. Though relatively a small state, only 1.53% area of India produced 12.2% of total food grown in India in 2001 for India's 1 billion people. No wonder it is called the breadbasket of India. Punjab gets its name from this undivided fertile land of five rivers. The region straddles the India-Pakistan border and there are Punjabis living on both sides. Though divided now into Indian and Pakistani Punjab, the region remains home to vibrant, hard-working people. This land at the crossroads of civilization has seen much turmoil over its history. From the invasion of Alexander the Great of Macedonia in 327 BC to the onslaught of Persians, the 350 years occupation by the Mughals of Central Asia and finally the 100 years of British Raj 
culminated in the partition of India in 1947. And while many Punjabis stayed home, there were those who ventured abroad to earn their living. Like me, they frequently returned to their ancestral land, our spiritual home. It is in our bones. Punjabi and other Indian expatriates are designated as NRIs or non-resident Indians. These dusty villages have hailed many extraordinary men and women excelling in other countries. As a tribute to the land of our birth, many of Punjabi NRIs generously contribute to building projects in their homeland, like schools and dispensaries. Arriving in my village, I find that the pattern of life remains the same, with only a few scattered changes here and there. Cultural icons remain. There is still a temple, a Sikh Gurudwara, where all the villagers worship. But this is not the one of my boyhood days. A very beautiful old Gurudwara and a big banyan tree were eliminated to make way for the new temple. And I wonder why the planners could not have incorporated the old structure in the new complex and saved the hundred years old tree. My whole family has immigrated to Canada and the United Kingdom. In our absence, our family homes fell into disrepair. I have decided to repair these properties as I plan to spend time here when I retire. Here in Duaba area, the land between Satlaj and Bayas rivers of Punjab, where I was born, daily life and traditions are alive and well, and preserved in modern garb. Television is a new feature and entertains the family as it does elsewhere around the world. Bedtime is an unchanged ritual, while breakfast is no longer cooked over a dung fire. The chapatis are as delicious as ever. In the past, entire families lived together, sharing the space and labor in a collective family system. Today, there is still cooperation, usually without many families under the same roof. In this village called Dhamod, Harpreet and Gurpreet are brothers. One works in town, the other has a workshop repairing agricultural equipment. They are both married and each has two children. Today, Gurpreet is repairing a wheat combine for the harvest. In the morning, Nina helps her two children to get ready for school. Afterwards, Harpreet leaves for the factory in nearby town. She washes the dishes and their clothes manually. Before the heat of the day, Nina and her sister-in-law pick mustard greens and white radishes for cooking. After school, the four cousins play in the fields. Sometimes both families take a break near the water tank. In her kitchen, Nina prepares the mustard leaves she had gathered and prepares sag, that is, green dish, a staple of their evening meal. After his dinner, Gurpreet continues his repair work while Harpreet and Nina shaft greens to feed the buffaloes.
When I was growing up, the Punjabi village economy supported most that lived here. But now farmland has become scarce, forcing many Punjabis to emigrate abroad. In addition to farming, serving in the armed forces was a preferred profession for Punjabis. Due to the changes in political and social climates, this option has become limited. When Punjabis leave, they take with them their unyielding work ethic and their commitment to family and faith. Punjabis have settled around the globe, most recently in the US, Canada, the UK, New Zealand and Australia. In this dispensary established by NRIs from Britain, homeopathic medicines are distributed free of charge. Every year, NRIs fund an eye camp where hundreds of people come for eye surgery. In fact, money from non-resident Indians is so vital to the nation's welfare that the Punjab government offers some incentives to attract their investment dollars. This fair is to entice NRIs from around the world to come home and use their foreign currencies to set up shop. When they return home as non-resident Indians, their foreign currencies help their families support and develop local businesses and boost foreign exchange reserves for the Indian government. Many of those who remain in Punjab migrate to the cities following a global trend whereby rural values are shifting and changing. Social changes are bound to take place because of the change in the economic structure, because of the influence of uh, other cultures due to migration of the population, and because of the developments in science and technology. Some changes take place because of the blind uh, copying of the other cultures or just because of uh, show off. And in our rural Punjab, both kinds of changes have taken place. Uh, three or four decades back, our women folk, uh, by tradition, used to cover their faces, especially from their father-in-laws or from the elder brothers of their uh, husbands. But now, women have become equal, they have been exposed to the equal educational opportunities and uh, they are taking all occupations. And this change required that that tradition should be abundant. And now our uh, daughters and sisters and our uh, mothers, they are roaming free, uh, freely with uncovered faces and they are uh, doing as good in all occupations as in uh, their uh, male counterparts. So this change is definitely desirable. Perhaps the shift in its values is best seen in this new seven-story Gurudwara. Only steps away stood the 200-year-old temple I attended as a boy. Today, it is a symbol of more than spiritual belief. It has become a symbol of prosperity. We used to enter through this entrance, the Darshini Deori. Both inside and out, 
The temple was covered with wall paintings like these, depicting our history. However, when it came to build a new temple, there was no effort made to preserve the old with its rich cultural heritage. I would like to see a policy where the treasures of our past are cherished, not demolished. Fortunately, the essence of our religion is being preserved. People have been praying at the Sikh Gurdwara for many, many years. I used to pray at this shrine when I was a boy. Today, people still gather here to pray and leave their offerings before beginning their day's work. This Gurudwara is dedicated to Baba Sangji, who spent many years of seva or service in the construction of the Sikh's famous golden temple in the times of Guru Arjun, the fifth Sikh Guru. When the construction work was complete, Guru Arjunji blessed Baba Sang and told him to return to his village and teach people meditation in God's name. Thousands of people visit this Gurudwara. Though the old temple has not been preserved, the belief system remains and retains the same vitality. Every Punjabi village pulsates with life. Before the sunrise, with the melody of crowing roosters, women milk buffaloes, churn milk, make breakfast for their families. After sending their children to school, they take breakfast to the men in the fields where they work crushing sugarcane making countries sugar, plowing, watering fields, or looking after the contract labor. There are always people sitting, playing cards, talking, buying, selling, haggling, or just simply being. There are a few whose hobby is racing bullock carts, and some who enjoy a cart ride. One other thing I noticed is that today's young people do not participate in folk sports, but they are more interested in game of cricket. Village life is still carefree and relaxed in comparison to city life. Even the animals seem to reflect the relaxed atmosphere. You can understand life in Punjab by the rhythm of its observances of holy days. Throughout the year, there are many festivals celebrated here. Sikh, Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist and Christian festivals. Punjab is proud of the diversity and unity of its inhabitants. The festival of Lori is similar to Halloween in the West. Smartly dressed children go from home to home in groups, singing songs for Lori. Instead of receiving candy for their trick or treating, they receive gifts of grain, country sugar, that is jaggery, or money. Late at night, there are bonfires in the streets. Volunteers collect sweets from the homes with newborn children, especially boys, or recently wedded couples, 
and the bounty is then shared around the fire. After the partition of India in 1947, Chokya has become popular again. The festival honors the Muslim saint Lalanwala Peer of Multan. A traveling feast, it goes from village to village for a month. Basant Panchami signals the end of the winter. Fields bloom with yellow mustard and green wheat, creating a spring patchwork quilt throughout the countryside. In the spirit of Basant, the women wear yellow scarves and men wear yellow turbans. Kites fly from rooftops. Punjab dons its spring colors. Another festival that is marked by brilliant colors is Holi. During Holi, neighbors exchange greetings and splash each other with festive colored sprays and powders. This is a Hindu festival. There are many myths as to its origins. One of them relates wholly to Lord Krishna playing with his companions with colors. These wonderful festivals contribute to the rich fabric of Punjabi life. All good things have downside as well. An undesirable side effect of my homeland's newfound prosperity is excessive drinking. It simply didn't exist in my boyhood days. In the past, people indulged in drinking only on festive family occasions. But now, my village has a liquor store, and it seems that a lot of the men consume alcohol almost every day. Another disturbing development is the extravagant expense of wedding ceremonies. So much money is wasted on food, alcohol, clothes and jewelry. It is not only the rich who are caught in this spending frenzy, but middle and poor classes are also the victims. Such indulgence leads ordinary persons into a lifetime of debt. Weddings are becoming a burden on the girl's parents. Apart from giving a good education to a daughter, parents have to provide a large dowry and they must meet many financial demands from the groom's family. Extravagant expenditure on the social ceremonies or the marriages. And in this, this is uh, going to an extent that our rural population, even to the point of getting bankrupt, uh, they go on uh, spending beyond their capacity. Commerce is everywhere. You meet all kinds of people selling goods on buses, trains and door to door. On the street, you can even buy medication for arthritis, dental cures or books on how to do various things. Walking commerce abounds. Fifty years ago, most of the villages had one or two general stores which met the daily needs of villagers. Larger purchases like timber, steel, meat, 
and major groceries were made in neighboring small towns where farmers used to sell their products. Barter was a common way of conducting business, trading farm goods with blacksmith and barber services. Today, every village has a lot of shops serving the local population. Some of these changes have affected not only village structure, but also agriculture. Farmers once used Persian wheels to irrigate crops, and bullocks were used for cutting, plowing fields, and harvesting. Today, there are tractors, tube wells, and canals. The most spectacular development is the 740 feet high Bhakranangal Dam and the barrage. With increased available water, more crops prosper. Not long ago, two-thirds of India's total food production was from Punjab. Today, farmers are trying various other cash crops, such as fruit, vegetables, peppermint, soya, and lentils. Prosperity has made life easier and brought with its share of problems. The current uh, farming in Punjab is reeling through many problems. The number one problem is the receding water table and uh, the farmers uh, have to opt for uh, the submersible pumps uh, involving huge expenditure. Second is the depletion of soil nutrients due to the monoculture of the crops year after year. Thirdly, the indebtedness of the farmers by getting loans to purchase tractors. Even the small farmers holding two acres of lands opt for a tractor which is not economically viable for them. The Bhakra Nangal Dam and the added prosperity from increased agriculture has brought benefits to all sectors of Punjab. Education has become universal. As a child, I attended this school in the late 40s. There were only two rooms and a veranda with two little storerooms on each end and a playground. We used to sit on the floor on mats. Some classes are still like that. Any homework was done under the candlelight or earthen oil lamps. However, that has changed, and a flip of a switch illuminates students' reading. Another major social shift is that now girls go to school too. They did when I was little, but not very many. There were only two in my class of 30. Today, women have equal access to education, and they exceed the male students with a ratio of 55% to 45%. In old days, one had to travel long distances to attend high schools. Nowadays, high schools are in abundance in villages. I used to bicycle nine miles every morning to attend high school. For college studies, most young people still have to travel to towns from their home village by transportation. One problem with today's education system, however, is a lack of technological sophistication. Unfortunately, a lot of what is learned does not lead to a job. I fear that a lot of education may be without practical application or value. 
Generally, education acts as an equalizer in a society. But in India, it has been used as a barrier to equality. India now has a three-tier education system for the rich, the middle class and the poor. Most of the government schools are for the poor. You will be astonished to know that even a normally student who has passed the primary he is not able to write his name properly even in his own mother tongue. And they don't know even the basic arithmetic. The, all the good teachers, they want to be posted in the urban areas. And the schools in the rural areas, they are without the teachers, they are without the laboratory facilities. Then where will the education come? Punjabis earn their money by sheer hard work and they spend it lavishly on the good things of life. Even though most people are very religious, they are also joyous. At every available opportunity, women and men enjoy dancing Punjabi folk dances, Bhangra and Gidda. Bhangra is now becoming known all over the globe. Lacking opportunity, many young people opt to emigrate. Even here, in remote villages, the influence of the West is inevitable. And the influence is good and bad. It has a pervasive impact on our culture. Within the last decade, there has been a boom in television stations. Large corporations are taking advantage of the business opportunity of selling to India's rapidly growing middle class. Local and national cultural issues are lost in the mix. There seems to be no thought to preserve the heritage. This was really brought home to me the day I visited a video shoot in village Jandiala based on old traditions. Is it family music? But it was so difficult to sell this album. Wherever we went with this album, they listened, they said it's a good music, but it won't sell. So uh, mix some ad, some beat music. Oh get some new popular singers to sing the these numbers only then it will sell but we believe that then the spirit will go it has to be very soft and very authentic tones and most of the singers are newcomers so we kept waiting we went from one company to another but everybody threw it out okay it is not commercially viable project so ultimately i convinced mr darshan kumar of t series that uh, Give me a trial. I won't charge money for uh, the music recording. You give me money for making the video. So I'll give you a music video. Then you you can sell the music video, and I'll get back my money which I had invested. My wife sold her ornaments because <laughs> to get this recording done. So ultimately, he agreed. There has been a big boom in teen targeted music with scantily dressed women appearing on TV. This is new. It is not part of our culture. Huge number of people are exposed to this programming and it's creating a dilemma for the society. Where do our cultural heritage and folklore fit in? What becomes of our cultural traditions? We of the senior generation are deeply concerned about uh, the way our youth is uh, taking to the new American style of life. Our architecture, for example, our music, for example, has been vitiated, 
has been uh, has been almost a deculturization has taken place it is it is i mean the, the kind of music that you hear it has nothing to do with this the, the soil of punjab the kind of poetry that you hear it has nothing to do with our language with our traditions of poetry the kind of kirtan for example that you hear is not kirtan everything has been made uh, uh, subjected has been subjected to the disco demands In some areas it is unfortunate that things remain the same and have been unaffected by the outside world. The caste system for example is as entrenched as ever despite efforts to eradicate it. This is preserved in part by government legislation that maintains a quota for underprivileged castes thus inadvertently reinforcing it. There is much intercaste resentment of special treatment for any other caste and yet the inequalities are there to be rectified untouchables still have to live separately religious and political leaders exploit the divisions in indian society bar paper ch padhan to pata lagda ve kai vari kai low caste de jatiyan da murder ho janda jivein bihar ch hoya ਲੋਕ ਕਾਸਟ ਨੂੰ ਬੁਲਾਉਂਦੇ ਨਹੀਂ ਲੋਕ ਨਾ ਸੋਸ਼ਲ ਲਿੰਕ ਘੱਟ ਰੱਖਦੇ ਆ ਪਰ ਸਾਡੇ ਪਿੰਡ ਵਿੱਚ ਗੁਰਦੁਆਰਾ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਬਣਿਆ ਵਧੀਆ ਬਾਬਾ ਸਿੰਘ ਜੀ ਦਾ ਤੇ ਇਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਦੇ ਪੈਨ ਪੇ ਘੱਟ ਬਹੁਤ ਆ ਇਨ ਵਿਲੇਜਸ देयर ਇਜ਼ ਸਟਿਲ ਅ ਲੈਕ ਆਫ ਸਿਵਿਕ ਸੈਂਸ ਐਂਡ ਬੇਸਿਕ ਸੈਨੀਟੇਸ਼ਨ ਥੀਸ ਆਰ ਇਨਡੀਡ ਏਰੀਆਸ ਵੇਅਰ ਪ੍ਰੋਗਰੈਸ ਵੁਡ ਬੀ ਵੈਲਕਮ In this village of Karodi NRIs and Punjab government are funding a program to install underground water drainage and sewage system They have also funded the creation of a park Punjab has been blessed with numerous men of god Guru Nanak the first Sikh guru Muslim Sufis and Hindu saints their teachings on pluralism and liberal thinking make Punjabis different from other Indians Fortunately some very important part of Punjabi life have not changed Villagers continue to celebrate and honor seasonal rhythms home to many sects over the centuries punjab has absorbed greeks sakars huns arabs and the english different religions live here in harmony and mutual respect it is a land that seems to breed tolerance moving now into this new century it is my heartfelt wish for my homeland that it continues to navigate a middle course through the inevitable changes that lie ahead embracing the new all the while preserving those cultural and religious traditions that make it uniquely the special place that it is globalization is a commercial reality yet I pray that Punjab will zealously guard its uniqueness by maintaining its core values and traditions. Se khan ko hukm hai guru maneo granth guru granth ji maneo pragat gura ki de From the timeless one comes the directive in accordance with which was established the Khalsa Panth to all six there comes the call acknowledge the grant as the guru for it is the manifest body of the masters yea with pure hearts seek the lord in his word bole so 
These worshippers here at the Gurdwara, a Sikh place of worship in Toronto, share something unique with Sikhs worldwide. It is 1,430 pages of scriptures called the Guru Granth Sahib and is omnipresent not only over festivals and ceremonies like this one, but also over the daily life of Sikhs. Like the Bible for the Christians, the Torah for the Jews, the Quran for the Muslims, or the Vedas for the Hindus, the Guru Granth Sahib contains the principles and teachings of the Sikh religion. But very few people outside of the Sikh faith are familiar with Guru Granth Sahib. What are its teachings? What is its history? Who compiled the scriptures? And what is its significance in daily Sikh life? This documentary will answer these questions and explore the fascinating world of the Guru Granth Sahib. The Sikh scriptures, or Guru Granth Sahib as it is called, is unique in the world. Unlike other holy books, for Sikhs it represents much more than a compilation of scriptures. Not only does it embody the spirit and philosophy of the Sikh religion, but it is considered to be the guru in perpetuity or spiritual guide that is a poetic celebration of God and humanity. It is also considered a sacred personification of the wisdom of the Sikh gurus and God's supremacy. In addition to the compositions of the Sikh gurus, the Guru Granth Sahib also contains the work of 15 divinely inspired Hindu saints, Muslim Sufis, 11 bards and four Sikhs belonging to different castes from all over India. It embodies five centuries of religious, philosophical and cultural history from the 12th to the 17th century. It is perhaps the only scripture in the world which sanctifies the writings of people who did not subscribe to the faith but believed in one God and brotherhood of humankind. In that sense, it is the only universal or non-denominational scripture that exists. Despite being compiled with writings over a span of centuries, the Guru Granth Sahib has a unity of language and thought. The script used in the Granth is called Gurmukhi, meaning from the mouth of the Guru. The language used is a mixture of Punjabi, the spoken language of the people of the Punjab, and Old Hindi, commonly used in Indian medieval and romantic poetry called Sunt Basha. Some of the other dialects of northern India were also used. <laughs> The Gurus believed that divine worship through music was the best way of achieving communion with God. And they knew that music and rhythm deeply affect the human soul. In the Granth, the major portion of poetry is arranged in different ragas and is meant to be sung. Ragas are usually sung according to the season or the time of day or night. Guru Granth Sahib is arranged in 31 major ragas. There are 29 mixed varieties of ragas also to be found in Guru Granth Sahib. Oh, 
The teachings of the Guru Granth guide Sikhs both in ceremony and in their daily lives. The creed of the Guru Granth, uncompromising monotheism, comes in a prelude to the work called the Jopji Sahib, written by Guru Nanak. Jopji is the most important of the five banis or daily prayers that devout Sikhs recite each day. Guru Nanak encouraged Sikhs to meditate and glorify God's name and greatness in what he called the ambrosial hours of fragrant dawn. Ek unkar, there is one supreme being, sat naam, the eternal reality. Karta purak, he is the creator. Without fear, Nirvair, devoid of enmity, Akal murak, he is immortal, Ajuni sabang, never incarnated, self-existent, known by grace through the Guru. Jab, Worship him. Prominent in the writings of the Guru Granth is the extreme importance of equality. Let no man be proud because of his caste. For the man who grasps God in his heart, he, no other, is the true believer. So, O oh fools, be not vainglorious about your caste and status. The Sikhs do not believe that death is the end. They believe a person's soul merges with God. If it does not, it is born again. This is called the transmigration of souls. The Guru Granth Sahib, page 793. The dawn of a new day is the message of a sunset. Earth is not the permanent home. Farida kothe mandap maadiya Usarende bhi gai Kuda sauda kar gai Today is the anniversary of the Khalsa of the Sikh faith. It is called Visaki. Thousands of people are gathered to celebrate this day. It is celebrated every year all around the world wherever Sikhs live. It was on Visaki Day in 1699 when Guru Gobind Singh Ji, the 10th Guru, established the Khalsa or saintly soldiers in Punjab, India. It was a defining moment in the growth and evolution of the Sikh faith. The Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb pursued a policy of intolerance towards other religions. Some Hindus from Kashmir approached the Guru and asked him to intercede on their behalf with the Emperor as they faced the prospect of forced conversion. The Guru sent a strongly worded message to the Mughal ruler asking him to refrain from his oppressive methods and to treat all his subjects with equality. Angered by this bold message, Aurangzeb ordered the arrest of Guru Teg Bahadur and later had him put to death by beheading in Delhi. Gobind Rai, the tenth Sikh guru, was only nine years old when his father's severed head was brought to him in Anandpur. As he grew into manhood, he recognized that love and forgiveness are stronger than hate and revenge. But he also acknowledged his responsibility to protect the ideals of his ancestors. So began Dharam Yud, the battle for righteousness. Guru Gobind built a fort and raised an army to fight the Mughals and the powerful Rajas of the hill regions. He was under constant attack from the enemy armies. Apart from defending his people, he protected and propagated the mission of the previous Gurus. 
Guru Gobind Rai was a born soldier, administrator, and spiritual leader. His military instincts and bravery won the respect of the enemy and the loyalty of his followers. Guru Gobind Rai knew that to preserve the Sikh faith, he had to challenge the Mughal rulers. He also knew that this task could only be carried out if a new spirit was infused in his followers. Hence, he conceived the formation of the Khalsa. He mixed sugar in plain water and stirred it with a double-edged dagger while reciting hymns, including some of his own compositions, and called it Amrit, the nectar. For their unquestioned loyalty, he baptized the five volunteers. The five, who up until then had belonged to five different castes, were made to drink out of one bowl to signify their initiation into the casteless society of the Khalsa. Their names were changed, and they were given one family name, Singh. Then he bowed down and asked for the baptism from the five beloved ones, and his name was changed to Guru Gobind Singh. Singh in Punjabi means lion. Aurangzeb then ordered the district governors of Sirhund and Lahore to help the Rajas to destroy the Khalsa. Anandpur was again besieged by the Mughals and the Rajas. Food ran short, and this time attempts by the entrapped Sikhs to break out were unsuccessful. Guru Gobind Singh and his followers had to face an overwhelmingly large force, but in spite of the odds against them, they continued fighting. The Sikhs bravely held their ground until the Mughals offered the Guru safe conduct if he evacuated Anandpur. Guru Gobind Singh evacuated the fort with his family and a small number of soldiers who had remained with him. He had not traveled very far when, contrary to their solemn oaths, the imperial forces and the hillsmen came in pursuit. The Guru entrusted his mother and two younger sons to a Brahmin servant and proceeded southwards. A band of Sikhs fell behind and held back the pursuers until they fell, fighting to the last man. Ultimately, the struggle to liberate India from the Mughals and to liberate the Sikh people can be traced back to Guru Gobind Singh and his Khalsa. It was the actions of this 10th Guru that led to the growth and expansion of the Sikh faith. And in the life of Guru Gobind Singh, the most significant action, the defining moment, was on that Visakhi day in 1699 when he founded the Khalsa and gave voice to the aspirations and beliefs of the downtrodden people. Guru Gobind Singh impressed upon the Sikhs the essentials of dignity and equality of all mankind before the one omnipotent creator. The celebration of the 300th anniversary of Guru Gobind's Khalsa is a day of judgment. The Khalsa reaffirms that it has been given a distinguished outward appearance as a sign of inner qualities of dharma or truth. The Khalsa is charged for the well-being of all humanity. This can be accomplished if the Khalsa becomes truly God's Khalsa. Vahiguru Jika Khalsa, and then spreads in the world Dharma, which means victory of God on earth, Vahiguru Ji Kifate. of a Hindu, marriage marks the 13th of 16 rituals and ceremonies. Ceremonies that begin with birth and commemorate significant rites of passage extending through to the end of mortal existence. Thus, marriage is considered not only a partnership in this life, but also in a more permanent and eternal sense. The Hindu wedding begins with a ceremony to honor the groom. The parents of the bride welcome the groom and then offer prayers to Lord Ganesh, the elephant-headed god. Oh, 
the Sikh wedding ceremony, known as Anand Karaj, has been practiced for more than 400 years, since the time of Guru Amar Das Ji. The four marriage hymns, called Lama, were written by his successor, Guru Ram Das Ji. Though the ceremony itself is centuries old, it was only in the 20th century that this form of marriage was made legal in India by the passing of the Anand Marriage Act in 1905. The Hindu and Sikh wedding ceremonies exemplify how marriage is among the most moving and reverential of all rites. It is a ceremony of joy, hope and love. It's a union not only of bride and groom, but of families and friends in a fervent wish for happiness and prosperity. It represents so much that is good in mankind, and it transcends culture, language, and faith, speaking the universal language of two hearts beating as one.